It'll mean a journey of 1,200 miles over rock and sand, by vehicle, camel, and on foot. And it's a dangerous journey. They call it the land of fear. It takes its name from the Arabic word for emptiness, Al-Zahara. The vast area that was submerged during the end of the Ice Age has never been studied by archaeology at all. And they're not in a position to say that they know that there's no possibility of a lost civilization during the Ice Age. While they haven't investigated those 27 million square kilometers that are now underwater, when they haven't investigated the Sahara Desert. When we think of the Sahara Desert, we think of endless sand. But what really lays beneath all the sand? The Sahara Desert, it's like a time machine preserving the ancient history of Earth under all that sand. The Nubian civilization, flourishing in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, is an incredible chapter of history that's often not as highlighted as it should be. This civilization, which stretched from around 2000 BCE all the way to 350 CE, shows us just how advanced and rich in culture, architecture and politics an ancient society could be. Imagine a civilization that lasted over two millennia, peaking during various periods like the Kingdom of Kerma, the Napatan period, and the Meroitic period. Nubia was strategically located along the Nile River, stretching from the first cataract in southern Egypt to the sixth cataract in central Sudan. This prime location along the Nile was not just for show, it played a huge role in establishing Nubia as a powerhouse of trade and economic activity. They were known for their abundant gold mines, which pretty much made them the go-to spot for luxury items like ivory, incense and ebony. These goods were highly sought after in both sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean world, making Nubia a crucial hub in ancient trade networks. In fact, that was one of the main arguments that the archaeological police used to try to dismiss John West and Robert Schock. Um, they said, uh, show us another culture that's 12,000 years old anywhere in the world and we might listen to you. But we know that there is no culture capable of creating anything like the Sphinx until 4,500 years ago. Therefore, of course, the Sphinx is 4,500 years ago. But, of course, that changed completely with Gobekli Tepe, which is uh, a deliberately buried site, deliberately buried 11,600 years ago. Now let's talk about Nubia's relationship with ancient Egypt. It was nothing short of complex and fascinating. The interactions ranged from trade and cultural exchanges to outright warfare and conquests. There were times when Nubian pharaohs actually ruled over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. This period is a testament to Nubia's strength and influence in the region. The kingdoms of Nubia, nestled along the Nile in what's now Sudan and southern Egypt, really tell us a story of an incredibly rich history, full of architectural wonders. Let's take a closer look at what made these kingdoms so remarkable. Starting with Kerma, dating way back to around 2500-1500 BCE, it's fascinating to think this was the first centralized state in Nubia. It was more than just a political hub. Its strategic location on the Nile made it a hotbed for trade. The architecture here was quite unique too, with large mud brick structures called defufas. Their purpose? Well, that's still something of a mystery. Were they temples, palaces or something else? And let's not forget the artistry in their pottery and crafts, especially the black-topped red ware and their work with ivory and gold. Then there's Napata, around 1300 BCE, which really left its mark as a cultural and religious center. This is where Nubia began to exert its influence over Egypt, especially during the 25th dynasty. Think about the Temple of Amun in Napata. It wasn't just a religious site, but a pivotal spot influencing Nubian culture and politics. And the royal burials of this time, with pyramids at sites like El Kuru and Nuri, show just how much Egyptian culture influenced them. Fast forward to around 300 BCE, 350 CE, and we see the capital shifting from Napata to Meroe. This move wasn't just geographical, it signified a shift in political and cultural power too. Meroe was a hub for the arts and industry, known especially for its iron industry and the development of the Meroitic script, an early African written language outside of the Egyptian hieroglyphic system. Part of now the problem is that very ancient structures, thousands of years older than archaeologists suppose, may be hiding in plain view. 
surrounded by other younger structures. And the best example of that really is the, is the Great Sphinx of Giza. And these two temples, these two temples in front of it. This temple is just is a New Kingdom temple much later the, even than the accepted date of the Sphinx, but, which is about 4,500 years ago. But the Sphinx and these two temples are deeply anomalous. Now let's talk about the architectural marvels of Nubia, the pyramids. Yes, Nubia had over 200 pyramids, mostly concentrated at places like El Kuru, Nuri, and Meroe. These weren't like the Egyptian pyramids we often think of. They were smaller, with steeper sides, and often featured elaborate carvings and hieroglyphics. These pyramids were royal tombs, and the burial chambers beneath them were often richly decorated. These pyramid complexes, part of larger royal cemeteries, included mortuary temples and chapels, showing a deep belief in the afterlife. The Garamantes civilization, centered in what's now southwestern Libya's Fezzan region, is a real eye-opener about how advanced ancient societies were, especially in such challenging environments like the Sahara. This area, known for its oasis environments, was crucial for sustaining life, and the Garamantes were pretty ingenious in adapting to these harsh conditions. So picture this. From around 500 BCE to 700 CE, the Garamantes were at their peak. This wasn't just a flash in the pan, it was a long period of development and stability. They were ahead of their time in agricultural techniques, urban planning, and establishing far-reaching trade networks. It's like they were the ancient masters of making the desert work for them. Archaeological digs in the region have unearthed some pretty cool stuff. For starters, they found these elaborate tombs, which really say a lot about their beliefs in the afterlife, something many ancient civilizations had in common. The complexity and size of these tombs also tell us there was a social hierarchy with different levels of wealth and status. The goods buried with the deceased give us a peek into their cultural practices and beliefs. The ruins of Garamantian cities are something out of an ancient urban planner's dream. They had organized street layouts that show a high level of social organization and civil engineering skills. What's more impressive is their water management systems. In a place as dry as the Sahara, they managed to create reservoirs and irrigation systems, which were crucial for their survival and agricultural activities. Plus, they had defensive structures hinting that they were prepared for potential threats. Now let's talk trade. They found Roman coins in the excavation sites, which means the Garamantes had trade connections with the Roman Empire. Imagine the caravans going back and forth across the desert. They also found Egyptian amulets and items from sub-Saharan Africa, showing that their trade network was vast and varied. The diversity of goods found at these sites underscores their role as a major trading hub and their interactions with different cultures. Uh, and weirdly, up there near Cuzco, we have this curious stonework, and we also have it at Alakahoyuk in Turkey. Exactly the same kind of thing. Is this a coincidence, or is there something going on behind the scenes of history that we've not been fully informed about yet? Um, and, and, and oddly, these, these patterns, these T-shaped pillars that we see at Gobekli Tepe are repeated at the Temple of Edfu in Upper Egypt and uh, also in Peru. Now moving on, Tassili Najer in Algeria is truly one of those places that take you back in time all the way to the early days of human civilization. Nestled in southeastern Algeria, right in the heart of the Sahara Desert, this area is a treasure trove of history. Picture this, vast sandstone formations, cliffs, deep valleys and rock shelters. It's not just a stunning natural landscape. These features have been key in preserving some incredible prehistoric rock art. Now let's talk about this rock art. It's not just a few drawings here and there. We're talking about artwork that dates back to the Neolithic period, some as old as 12,000 years. Discovered by a French military expedition in the 1930s, these paintings give us a fascinating glimpse into the lives of the people who lived back then. You've got human figures, wild and domestic animals, and scenes that show everything from hunting and gathering to dancing and rituals. What's really interesting is how the art changes over time, starting with wild animals and hunting scenes and gradually moving to domesticated cattle and herding. It's like a visual story of how these ancient folks transitioned from hunting gathering to pastoralism. But it's not just about the art. Archaeologists have found all sorts of tools and pottery in Tassili Naja, indicating that people have been living here for thousands of years. These artifacts range from simple stone tools used by hunter-gatherers 
to more sophisticated items linked to settled communities. It's amazing how much you can learn about past lifestyles and technological progress just by looking at these objects. Now let's not forget about preserving this incredible site. Tassili Najer was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1982, which is fantastic because it helps in getting the support needed for its preservation. But keeping this site in good shape isn't easy. The art is facing threats from natural erosion and potentially even climate change. Plus, there's the impact of tourism. Sure, tourism raises awareness and brings in funds for preservation, but it also means more people walking around these precious artworks. When you think of the Sahara Desert today, it's all about vast stretches of sand and scorching heat, right? But believe it or not, this wasn't always the case. There's a whole hidden history beneath those dunes, and it's been uncovered through the study of fossils and isotope analysis. So let's dive into this hidden past. The Sahara has turned up fossils of all sorts of aquatic life. We're talking fish, mollusks, and even plants. And these aren't just any old fossils. They're often in great condition, which is pretty wild considering they've been under the desert for ages. These fossils got preserved because they were quickly buried under sediments in ancient lakes and rivers, which kept them safe from decay. And the dating of these fossils? It goes back millions of years, painting a long history of environmental change in the Sahara. Now these fossils tell us a lot about what the Sahara used to be like. Fish fossils suggest there were rivers and lakes around, while marine shells hint at the possibility of larger water bodies, maybe even shallow seas. Plus, the variety of species points to a time when the Sahara was home to rich and diverse ecosystems. But here's where it gets even more interesting. These fossils aren't just found in one spot, they're all over the Sahara, which means these water bodies were widespread. Satellite imagery and geological surveys have even mapped out ancient river systems that line up with where these fossils were found. And there's a lot of variation in the types and amounts of fossils in different areas, showing just how diverse the climate and environment were across the Sahara. Then there's isotope analysis, which is like a detective tool for figuring out past climates. By looking at the ratios of certain isotopes in sediment layers, scientists can work out past temperatures and rainfall. Higher ratios of oxygen-18, for example, usually mean more evaporation, pointing to warmer, drier periods. Carbon isotopes can tell us about the types of plants that were around, giving clues about how much rain there was. This isotope analysis has been super useful in understanding how the Sahara's climate has changed over time. It's shown variations in rainfall, helping to piece together the story of how the Sahara went from lush and green to the desert we know today. And it's not just about the Sahara. This data fits into the bigger picture of global climate events like ice ages. So, in a nutshell, the Sahara's past is a lot different than its present. Once a place with rivers, lakes and a variety of life, it's now the iconic desert. But thanks to fossils and isotope analysis, we can glimpse its green past and understand the changes that led to its current state. It's a fascinating reminder of how much our planet can change over time, 